Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Voltron Online podcast. This is the Voltron show for Avatar The Last Airbender Online.com. And this episode we're going to be reviewing Voltron Legendary Defender Season 5. We're going to be talking about all six episodes, everything that happened within the season. So, uh, I'm going to be your main host for this episode, Morgan, Airspeed Prime, site super moderator for Avatar The Last Airbender Online.com. Joining me on the podcast is just one other host, and that is Greg, Greg2B from the site. What's up, everyone? Excellent. So, that's our team for today. So, the focus of this episode, obviously, is going to be on Season 5, which came out uh, two weeks ago, I think, at this point. Um, so, we're a little bit delayed in discussing this, but it gave us more time to kind of actually watch it, rewatch it, and stuff like that. Um, but I suppose before we jump into Season 5, uh, Greg wasn't on the Season 4 for recording that we did to review that. I think it was just myself and Kelly. So uh, re very, very quickly, Greg, uh, what were your thoughts on season four? I believe, if I remember correctly, myself and Kelly thought it had a few good moments, but overall was probably one of the weaker seasons of Ultron so far. But what were your thoughts on season four? Um, yeah, that probably would be close to my sentiments as well. Um, I mean, I remember there being a couple sort of standout moments, and it did have, I don't know, I guess it had some fun sort of like side quirky things as they were sort of trying to gather everyone sort of together to sort of help them to sort of mount out their whole sort of like, you know, defense that they're going against um, Zarkon and his forces when he actually did sort of come back by the end of it. Um, but other than that, there wasn't too much that really sort of stood out for me um, in that episode, at least that I can remember now after watching the season five here. Mm, indeed, and I suppose we, we always tend to start these off with just kind of how was the uh, the Netflix viewing style for each season. Uh, it's not as interesting, I think, of a topic because we're we have much shorter seasons. I think the last three seasons have been seven. Last season was six. This season is six. So it's. Um, it's kind of like a double length of like kind of like a season finale of a normal show in that it's not that many episodes. Um, my my own kind of viewing experience was a uh, a little weird because like I th I think when when it aired like I was just kind of back from hospital so it was kind of like the the perfect kind of thing to just like sit there and watch. <laughs> uh, I was just kind of resting to recover. Um, but uh, Greg, what what were your thoughts? Uh, you know, with the the Voltron, the Netflix style, getting the whole season at once. Um, I don't know. It's I don't know. I think even though I, I guess I should be used to it by now, it still seems kind of odd. I don't know for some reason. Like I'd even think about it like sort of like coming out. I think just the way that sort of things are released now, on Netflix, where they just sort of like appear. Because I was just like I just happened. I think I finished watching like some other show um and i just saw you know of course you know on netflix you can see you know what's coming up and you know since it's already you know completely sort of like geared toward your viewing habits of course voltron comes up in you know the main page back and is playing like you know the silent trailer in the background like oh season five is out i guess i should watch this and then you know i text my friend or whatever he's like yeah i guess it's out so i started watching i think i watched I think usually I try to pace myself slightly. I mean, I still do it all in like one day mostly, but I you know, I watch like the first three and then I take a break or do something else. Um, and then I go back and watch the, the next set or whatever. Um, so I don't know. It's still kind of an odd thing because you still, you know, like you just dump the whole thing. Um, even if you do try to take like some sporadic breaks in between episodes and stuff, but I don't know with it being, with it being so short, it's like, there's no reason to really sort of like, pace yourself as much as I did sort of like with like um the first seasons or whatever when it was like you know the whole 12 or whatever then I actually like I think I specifically took like a week or so to watch it and only watch like you know two episodes a day or something like that um versus this is like you know it's, it's almost just like a movie basically it's just like an extended movie when you do you know when you put all the episodes together so mm, yeah like the, the shorter seasons it, it's much easier to discuss it doesn't feel like you have to put in like tons of time where like you have to kind of stay away from the fandom or anything like that for a long period of time it's just a case of like oh the season's out i'm not really gonna go anywhere near anything voltron related until i watch it and then i'll join in the discussions like put out my video or whatever so in that sense it, it, it is good um and i think six episodes is a solid amount to just get people talking and um, obviously it depends on the quality of the season last season there wasn't as much discuss discussion 
This season, though, there is a lot to discuss, which is really, really good, and there's a lot of hype towards season six. And um, so I, I definitely like the way they're doing it, and that the, it, the wait between seasons doesn't feel super long. Um, especially like knowing that it's only like just over three months until we get the next season. So, um, in this case, like it's it's working out well because it seems like we're getting Voltron quicker even if maybe it doesn't actually work out that way but let's get into season five the new stuff as I said six new episodes we get uh, episode one the prisoner episode two blood duel um, episode three is post-mortem episode four is crawl Zera episode five is bloodlines and episode six is called white lion um, I suppose we'll get into just general thoughts on the season, then we'll get into some specifics. Um, overall, uh, how impressed were you with season five? Um, I think it was it's definitely a lot better than last season. Um, I don't know, I still think it's sort of weird just the way that it ended, but I think that's just because of the style of the you know the six episodes now. But I think overall for me, I think it, it wasn't that bad. I, I don't think there's anything too much in like any of the specific episodes that stood out to me as being like really sort of like awkward per se i guess you know not like sort of like the last season but i don't know i think it's still i don't know the way it ends it's, i mean of course it's only half a season so it always feels like there's more it just feels i don't know it's a bit interesting with how they sort of ended things on sort of like they sort of dropped some things on episode five and then they sort of did you know a whole sort of different things in episode six which i think is pretty cool and it's definitely like a lot of sort of neat sort of setups and stuff so it's definitely you know you can tell that this is like you no know, i guess sort of like the first half of a bigger part versus like some other um you know sort of half seasons so i don't know i think it's still pretty good overall yeah, I was actually very impressed with this season. Um, it had a lot to do after last season, and I thought, I think maybe minus the first episode, which I think isn't the best episode, it has a <laughs> couple of nice moments at the very end to set up that. I think it's a pretty eventful season. A lot happened. They did a lot to really, I suppose, change the overall kind of dynamic of Voltron as a series from like focusing on one thing to focusing on another. And um, there was a lot of kind of plots that we've known about that like oh when are they going to commit to this that they finally kind of uh, committed to they did that with a few different things and yes I think the the ending as you say was a little bit of a weird point it didn't feel like a season finale it felt like oh where they ended it felt like just we're about to get into like the meat of this season but yeah because yeah. of the way that they're going about things this is technically a season finale even though I think it's more meant to be like a a mid-season finale type thing in that I think season six is just going to start right in the middle of action rather than an opener kind of like mm -hmm. th the the first episode of this season did kind of feel like a season opener the way they did it but uh, I don't yeah. think it's going to feel that way for next season but um, yeah I, I, I was very impressed with what we got overall and um, so yeah, we'll get into specific talking points now. Full spoilers, of course. Um, so um, if you haven't seen it yet, go watch it, then come back and watch the rest of the discussion. So I suppose, Greg, um, what's the first talking point uh, you want to get into from season five? Um, I mean, I'll just start straight up from the beginning with the bigger sort of, I guess, finally after all of, you know, the past seasons building up to Pidge and, and her father here and just sort of the idea of how we got Sam you know back and you know from being captured and whatnot and how that felt you know i guess how did how did that payoff feel for you was it good or bad because i think it's it's kind of interesting or just sort of odd how i how i personally feel about it um it was weird because it's such a small number of episodes since we got matt back and it kind of feels like whoa they, they went for both characters very very quickly but at the same time i sort of respect that and kind of get why they did that because it is two ultimately fairly similar plot points of just trying to find two specific characters in the galaxy and one was more of a search that kind of helped the alliance with Matt already being a rebel and this was more of a like a, the villains are using Sam because he's actually really intelligent and he's helping things and they're going to use him because they know he's related to Pidge to get what they want. So um, even though I think both happened very quickly, 
I did like overall how they used kind of uh, why Sam, I suppose, came back into play so quickly of just like a uh, quick search for him and then um, Oxia and the, the others, the, the kind of uh, the the generals that were kind of, uh, you know, out of the Empire, used them to get back in and Zarkon kind of uses them. They, a lot of stuff, I think, happened in, in early on in the season to, to make it a... An interesting enough thing, um, and and then I, I will get into I suppose what they do with Sam afterwards. But I, I didn't mind them going ahead with it so soon. It was still emotional. They had the I think correct reactions from like Paige and Matt to uh, what was happening and the tensions around that it was a direct deal with Zarkon. But uh, what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, I think. You're right. There was definitely a lot of tension. Like you can definitely see how it affected, you know, Pidge and her brother Matt. And I think that part was was pretty good. Um, I don't know. I think you know, and it was cool that it did lead to like sort of a, a bigger duel. I think that was pretty neat how they sort of you know set that up and how they were dealing with Zarkon. I don't know. It just seemed, and maybe it was because they just did it with Matt. Um, in sort of like a, a different sort of ish sort of fashion, but still essentially the same sort of thing. But it seemed, I don't know, for some reason, the fact of sort of getting Pidge's father back, I don't know, it seemed to me at least that it had, that it should have had, you know, that it had so much buildup from all of the past sort of seasons. So I expected, I don't know, I'm not sure what I expected, but I definitely, you know, expected it to be sort of a, a pretty sort of i don't know bigger sort of event which i mean i guess you know taking down zarkon is pretty much a big event but i don't know it just seemed maybe it was just because of how quickly they did it in just these two episodes and then of course they just sort of you know like send them away to sort of help with earth so maybe that could lead to something later on which could be interesting um but i don't know it definitely seemed the way that they went about it was definitely pretty quick yeah um I think the other thing is that I think they were always going to find it hard to make it more emotional than how they went about, I suppose, uh, Pidge's search for Matt and that initial kind of moment of her thinking that he's dead when we're at the mm -hmm. kind of uh, memorial for all the rebels and she actually sees like his transponder there and it's just this kind of desperate kind of final moment where she actually realizes there's some hope. Um, whereas here the kind of action search was actually primarily done with like Matt and then those two side characters uh, Rollo and Naima who were from like one of the more fillery episodes from I think the first season and now they're part of the the coalition and um, it was kind of like a, I thought that was a weird choice to kind of just have Paige primarily just fighting a random battle up in space whereas Matt and then two side characters were the ones actually like down on the in the in the fortress basically having the disappointment of not finding him and um, that's i think where it maybe fell a little flat and they maybe could have done a bit better setup towards it um i think i think where i suppose they got the emotion from was when the plot of we're gonna trade um zarkon wants to trade lotor for sam and this being a kind of a difficulty because Lotor is actually being very helpful to the coalition and they kind of want to use him more and obviously they're dealing with basically the last person in the whole galaxy they can trust but it's such a high emotion kind of moment for Paige and Matt that all they can see is that they have to go ahead with the trade and the the build up to it the the actual double cross and how that turns into like a really really cool battle that you almost don't expect to happen so soon and then a uh, an interesting kind of melee fight scene in the uh, the transport with like Oxia, Ezor, and Zephrid. Uh, um, so it, it worked out, I think, nice enough how it happened. But I think that the the middle point of just the search for him wasn't as interesting as the others. Um, I suppose while we're while we're on this, um, did did you have any thoughts on the fact that they? they kind of lowered the power level of Oxia, Zethrid, and Ezor, the way they were kind of dealt with while they were in the, the transport there? I don't know, it's, it's weird, because I'm like, 
they seem not as you know strong as they have been before but maybe they're trying to sort of like play up just the, the disadvantage of them being sort of in in the transporter in the shuttle and that's sort of like offsetting the power or i guess we're you know supposed to go on the other way and saying that you know our team is you know better than they were previously which i mean i don't think it's been that much of a period of time and we, it's not like we've seen them do any more sort of like you know training montages like we've seen them do before um so it's not like they've improved maybe that much from what we've seen last time so i don't know it's definitely the odd one because they you know it definitely seems like they're on par or maybe they're just you know being more in, you know in intuitive on you know how they're able to sort of fight in such a confined space i don't know this is it's definitely something of note of how they sort of you know how they're sort of over you know able to overcome that because it you know it definitely seems like they would be you know our team would be at a the good guys would be at a disadvantage mm-hmm so I suppose while we're on Sam, we'll we'll, we'll cover his arc because he is very separate for the most part. Um, they do a they do a little bit with him um, in episode uh, three on Alcarion as he kind of uh, initially reveals that he he's going back to Earth and that he kind of expects them to come with him and they they Paige and Matt are the ones to kind of reveal to him and shock him that they want to stay and finish the war before they head back to Earth because that's they, they're in responsible roles. Uh, Matt's a rebel and Paige is obviously a paladin. They have to accomplish their goals before they go back. And through this mission, this is what I suppose convinces uh, Sam that that is the, the right thing for them to do. And then he heads back to Earth on his own. And um, through him, I suppose we get the... Um, I suppose the return of Earth back into the plot in that we have the characters sending messages back to Earth so finally their parents are going to know where they are um, <laughs> and finally Earth is going to know that full on for sure there are like other alien races out there and there's a war coming and Galaxy Garrison is mentioned again and that the Earth is going to need defenses because um, I suppose with the Galra Empire in chaos it's just gonna like any planet could be hit and so that's where the kind of um uh the defense kind of uh situation comes in so um i i like that they're using sam for this and that i think it would have been a mistake to just immediately incorporate him and have him just be kind of like matt 2.0 basically and just have the three holes <laughs> uh, together so i think they did kind of have to you know more or less get rid of him fairly soon but i think they did it quite well of just you know him seeing how important they are and that kind of line of like you know i now see what like or like everyone now sees what i've always said that like you you two are like the best and and so on but uh what were your thoughts on i suppose the what they did later on in the kind of season with sam and ending him for this season going back to earth yeah no i think that's actually uh it's a good way of using his character because yeah he he doesn't really need to be sort of part of the group um just because you know we pretty much have his his type of roles like his smarts or his you know sort of pitch being in action sort of you know roles sort of fulfilled and you no know, it just seemed like this would be you know if there was ever a time when you no know, we could actually have you know someone actually go back to earth and sort of like get them involved or, or ready for sort of like the the battle to come you no know, he would be you know the character who's you could send back and not you know feel bad that he's not sort of part of the group because you know he he never really was part of the group so no i think that you know, actually works pretty well and it's i don't know it'd be interesting to see you know if they ever do actually do anything with Earth or, you know, some of the sort of Zarkon's, you know, forces now that everyone's sort of split apart, you know, sort of goes to attack, you know, now, you know, and there could actually be a reason for Voltron to actually go back to Earth since before there's really, you know, there's the whole sort of, you know, the whole universe basically that they still have to, you know, have to get back. And even though, you know, at this point, what they say, they said they have like a third of it cleared, there's still two thirds that they have to sort of deal with um, as far as, you know, getting back, you know, from Zarkon's original forces. And, you know, we'll see how that actually sort of plays out and, and if that's even, you know, something that they can even hold on to the third that they have right now. So it's definitely, you know, it's, it's a long sort of battle that could be drawn out for for quite a while so you know there's no real no rush for them to ever sort of i guess you know see or get back to earth unless it's actually sort of in danger mm, yeah but i i think that's a plot point that it's going to be big when it happens because you know eventually yeah. they're going to realize that you know they're from earth like almost all of the paladins are from earth and 
a lot of their <laughs> main allies are from Earth. Why not use that to kind of gain an advantage over them? Um, plus, I suppose they sort of have to reveal the like earlier history of the Galra Empire with Earth, because obviously we know like with the whole Keats mother thing from like season two and what they reveal in this season, that at least some Galra stuff has been on Earth because that's the nature of like the first couple of episodes as well of the series. Um, but my first talking point is obviously what happens basically in episode two um, and it's kind of happening while they're rescuing Sam and that is the surprising that it happened so early in the season. Um, big big battle between Lotor and his father Zarkon and especially I suppose the result that Zarkon's dead and from all reports from like interviews with like Joaquin de Santos this is like the full-on end of Zarkon in the series they're, they're not really being coy about this that like oh he could return they've already done that this seems like they've they've fully gotten rid of him he's only been back for like five episodes but He's taken out now, and um, Lotor has killed his father. And um, some very interesting stuff um, happens here. In that, the other plot point it presents is that Shiro gave um, Lotor the Black Bayard and didn't tell anyone, and that becomes an issue of kind of trust between Shiro and the team later on to set up that. But the fight itself, I, I thought, was very well done. Zarkon in his kind of power suit and then the kind of just raw skill technique of um, um, Lotor in just how he how well he was able to use the Bayard um, I think one thing they haven't been particularly clear on is that like are they suddenly now revealing that Lotor is sort of a kind of chosen one with regards to being like could he be a potential black paladin or can anyone more or less use the Bayards um, that's sort of unclear but Either way, it sets up Lotor as, like, if they absolutely needed to, maybe he could pilot the Black Lion at some point. But I was very surprised that they just committed to killing off Zarkon in the second episode. But at the same time, I feel it's what they had to do because, as we've discussed, I think, on some of these reviews, Zarkon is not the most interesting character in the show. Uh, I think they've <laughs> given him his arc now, that he's been resurrected, he's had his big fights... We've dealt with, I suppose, him trying to get the Black Lion back and fighting with Shiro for control. More or less everything's been resolved and all that's kind of left is just, I suppose, referencing his origin story in a way of like what took over him to make him fully evil. But I think you can do that with Hagar on Erva. So um, there, there's, there's still stuff they can do, um, but uh, I was very kind of happy ultimately by the end of the season with how they did it and and the the result of this to what it does to the Galra Empire but uh, what were your thoughts on just them having this battle so early in the season and then having a full-on finish to the battle in Zarkon's death? Yeah no it's definitely you know they definitely made really sort of quick work of it and the battle itself was pretty cool it's definitely cool to see them sort of go going back and forth but I don't know I guess you know it's not i mean when they sort of brought him back in this whole sort of like you know power suit and you can't even really sort of you know see who he is who he is, you know what he looks like you know from from back before it seems like they're just sort of you know setting it up so that like he you know we really just don't not that we ever really did sort of care about him just because of that's just how his character is just portrayed but you know they're really just sort of you know like even though he is you know still you know immensely sort of powerful and still you know the big bad of the universe you know they're almost sort of like setting him up for for fall just by having him in this sort of suit and having him you know it just seems like he has you know more limits now granted those limits are still sort of like you know crazy and you wouldn't really expect anyone to sort of be able to sort of hold her on too much to him and you know Lothar you know he did sort of get knocked around a bit it's not like it was like an easy battle for him to do but you know you definitely do get to see more of Lothar sort of his skills and his techniques um I guess just in general in this season, you definitely get to see him just, I mean, I guess just this, his season in general, just to be more involved in the group and just, you know, part of it since he's, you know, for now, you know, one of the good guys. Um, so, yeah, that was definitely, you know, something that you don't really expect to happen sort of, I guess, in the beginning of a season. But I don't know, maybe that's just because of the, the format of how, you know, this show is now formatted with these six, you know, episodes that, you know, anything can sort of happen at any point in the sort of season just because of 
of how it's sort of flowing all together. So it's definitely different, but it's, it's not, not something that's like particularly bad in any way, I think. Yeah, and uh, I think the final thing just to quickly mention here is that um, one thing Zarkon says to Lotor in the middle of their fight is that um, he kind of calls like Lotor his like uh, greatest failure because he's half uh, Altaian blood, which kind of becomes a pretty big plot point. Uh, it's, it's mentioned a, a couple of times, um, but it was interesting that it, you kind of question like why did he even have a child if he already always knew it was going to be. Altaian and it, it obviously begs questions of like did he because they were Onerva and original Zarkon were changed by the kind of quintessence kind of sentient energy thing and became evil that way were both of them even aware of like what their full races were when this happened or not and um, so it could have been a surprise to potentially both of them that he like that Onerva was Alt Altaian Hagar was Altaian um and thus Lotor became Altaian, but uh, we'll get to that. But uh, Greg, what's your next uh, talking point? Uh, I don't know. I guess I kind of want to touch down a little bit, just because it just you know it just seemed like that whole idea of just sort of their sort of like memories sort of coming back um, throughout this whole sort of show. It always sort of like it always sort of throws me sort of sideways, just because I'm sort of like. You know, it's like, you know, by the end of this, she, you know, she realizes that, you know, that's her son. And, you know, it seems like, I don't know, it seems like however they were affected by the quintessence, it just sort of, you know, it's like, it's removed, like, part of their memories. Granted, they have been, you know, alive for, like, you know, what is it, like, 10,000 years or whatever. So, you know, it is a long period of time and, like, you know, any normal person wouldn't even survive that, let alone have, like, the memories of that length. But... I know it just seems like it's so sort of specific on how they sort of like when they sort of remember things and sort of how it sort of comes back to them and just sort of you know just the fact of you know Lotor not sort of knowing you know who's actually his mom is and, you know when they sort of mention that later on when they're sort of you know sort of going through her things um when they get to the actual sort of you know base and everything so it's just I don't know it's one of those things that always sort of you know I mean, I'm sure it's one of those things that'll be sort of like cleared up by the end of it, or at least I hope it is. But it's one of those things that, you know, when it sort of comes back into play, you know, for a very sort of key, you know, story elements, it seems like it's like a hump sort of moment almost. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting how they did it because, um, like, the, the key pieces of information are that, like, Lotor reveals that he knows his mother is Onerva, which is weird because she was. I suppose it's hard to fully look back at that flashback and be like, was she Onerva back then or was she Hagar? I think she was still Onerva back then because in the yeah. last episode, the kind of documents make it clear that, you know, Onerva was sort of more or less crazy towards the end before I suppose the full shift happened. So he, he knows who his mother is. He knows he's kind of half blood. Um, the, the question obviously is Hagar herself. Um, and when I watched it the first time, I was I was definitely really confused, like you, or like, wait, she just got this memory back that Lotor is her son. Why is she still going ahead with all these like evil plans and stuff like that? But then, I I think that the interpretation that you kind of have to have is just that, uh, like Hagar is a separate person to Onerva. Hagar is evil and is loyal to the Galra Empire, and even though she's gaining her memories back of when she was good she still fundamentally is Hagar and doesn't feel the same way that Onerva does. She's just gaining like these memories of kind of her past that she's forgotten. So it's just kind of like, okay, I'm still the same person I was. I just have now this other information that like Lotor is my son. And so I know these specific things, but she's still going about her own mission because she's still corrupted by the the quintessence from the the dibazol kind of rift thing and um, it's it's really interesting because obviously it becomes a huge plot point with the who's going to be the next uh, emperor of the galra empire and do they accept like a half blood as the as the leader but um i i really like this as a kind of ancient history type thing because it still makes you sort of question, like, how old is Lotor? I, like, because, <laughs> yeah. because they, they make it a kind of plot point of, like, Hagar and Zarkon are both 10,000 years old, but 
they are meant to sort of look both kind of like monsters in a way that like they're different than everyone else yet he's implied to more or less be roughly the same age like I suppose like 9,000, 8,000 or something like that <laughs> years old um, but he's he just looks like a standard Galra admittedly you know, being half Altaian um, so like how does that happen and so I suppose it ultimately just comes down to like did they develop quintessence enough to where most Galra can use it enough to just become thousands of years old but not become corrupted whereas those two went right into the heart of like the energy that they're kind of going after and obviously were corrupted like directly by evil as far as we're aware but um uh what are your thoughts on that like the just lotor's age and how it uh links into things about like why he knows certain information why he doesn't know certain information yeah it definitely seems like he would essentially be you know a lot older than you would you know think just based on you know purely sort of like physical sort of appearance here so i don't know i mean it makes it sort of you know i mean just the fact that he's been doing sort of like all this research on altaian history and he's been developing all these things i mean it seems like he's you know he's been a part of this empire you know almost as long as it sort of has been around which makes sense why it would be hard for like anyone to basically sort of trust him and you know to make you think that you know regardless of his current sort of like you know being you know sort of on the right sort of side of things that you know it can't really you know sort of last for for too long just because of how you know i don't know how he's sort of been brought up i mean you, you know you sort of see that in the last episode his you know his response to the white line versus you know Alora's response to the white line is completely different because of just you know of how he's been raised and how he's been brought up even if he is sort of half altane so yeah no i mean it's definitely his age is definitely one of those things that i'm always sort of like questioning you know how old is he really i mean i don't know it's just, i'm sure it'll be something that will be sort of like explained but like it definitely seems like they're they're trying to use it in a specific way yeah well at the very least we know he's multiple hundreds of years old because in his dialogue he said that like i've been researching altean alchemy for centuries so yeah like, that that confirms that it's not just a case of like he was born like 20 25 years ago or something like that. <laughs> yeah and um, so it that that immediately says like okay so it, it, he probably is a, at least a couple of thousand years old and we know that they the galra stay alive by using quintessence and uh because lotor continues to talk about quintessence you know obviously it's a, it's a key plot point in the season and um, but i suppose yeah we'll, we'll we'll get into lotor a bit here he kind of is the the star more or less i think of the of the overall season with what they do with him and yeah. um, early on i think it, it's interesting of like he's giving them all the information about like targets to take down for voltron and it's all about should we trust him should we not trust him and and even by the end i think we as the audience are still feeling that way a bit and like i think to a degree characters like lance are still sort of a little bit apprehensive about lotor but for the most part we go through this full season and most of the cast i think trust him and i think the big plot point is that allura seems to really trust him by the end because of this journey they went on but she doesn't know the one key piece of information that you know i suppose he made the wrong decision in the kind of uh, test of the white line at the end and i suppose the, the the question becomes like was pointed out earlier on the season is this just a long game plan from Lotor to ultimately use Team Voltron and Allura specifically, or is he a a good guy basically? He just is kind of um sort of suffering from his heritage in that he's sort of going down the path of his mother of like being obsessed with the the science of quintessence and he's also sort of going down the path of his father by being too much of a warrior and uh doing that uh what what is it he says kind of something or die um as he you know basically kills the wolf the, the basically the galra kind of code in a way right at the end that he thinks he should be able to do exactly like allura does but he kind of falls to his kind of uh weaknesses based on like his his heritage right at the end so like my interpretation is that like he's just kind of like a flawed character 
and maybe there's some potential for some double crossing but I don't think he's kind of fully out and out evil but I think there's a lot of room to go whatever way they want to go I think this season they really managed to I think turn him into a kind of complex Zuko kind of like character where he could make so many different decisions and you kind of want to trust him because he's such a you know well done character but you also know that he has the potential to do all this other stuff because he's so powerful so what were your thoughts on how they just in general across the season approach you know um, characterizing Lotor yeah, no, I think their their characterization of his sort of character and his sort of, you know, attempts to sort of work with Team Voltron, I think those were, were, were pretty good. I like, you know, how they sort of started to set it up of, you know, having the characters, you know, attempt to sort of try to trust him and sort of, you know, just them having, you know, such history just from the whole Galra Empire that, you know, it's hard to trust anyone basically from, from the Galra sort of empire. But, you know, we do have, you know, the Blades of Memoir. So, you know, we have you know they've started you know showing that you know there are galra that you that you can actually trust and you know we have all the the you know undercover sort of galra sort of you know blade more sort of like agents um you know like keeps mom that we find out about later on so you know they're they're attempting to show you know that the garo can be you know more than just you know sort of you know bloodthirsty sort of like warrior type characters you know i think you know just in general this season does a good job of just characterizing i guess just the empire in general just you know i guess you know when you have you can see you know the garo sort of soldiers and not just sort of like you know the throwaway sort of robots that they're always sort of using it, it sort of helps you know sort of like place them as far as you know just being you know people it's just sort of characters because when you just see the robots you know like well of course they're just you know default sort of like you know baddie type characters but when you actually get to see them like even you know the one sort of like random side part of the episode where we have you know um uh pigeon and Hunk, you know playing with the the robot or whatever and we do get to see two other sort of random goal regards which for some reason i was like there's no like there's no actual Gora in that whole sort of base for some reason until you see some other ones. Um, no, it just it sort of helps put them. So I think that you no, know, that works along the lines of Lotar as far as giving him sort of some sort of character, and, you know, and making him sort of complex, you know, like Zuko, like like you said. But I don't know for some reason, you know, and it's probably just the way that they're writing him. He still seems like he has more potential for going bad than for staying the good at least from from my point of view and just you know his sort of decision at the end of episode six as far as you know how he was sort of gonna defeat the the lion to sort of you know to get the secrets of you know of the Altaian sort of history you know which you know it's just he wouldn't you know he wouldn't know how to sort of submit he's just you know he's he's more Gaara in that sort of aspect there which you know maybe that's sort of why it sort of leads me to believe that you know eventually he is just sort of going to um, you know betray them in the long run and even if it isn't something that he has like you know right now it doesn't seem like he has that sort of intention you know as of far as what he's going to do but you know it seems like there could be something very sort of easily that could set him off to go you know back towards the the bad path versus the good path so i don't know i guess it's just sort of one of those sort of like waiting game things to sort of see you know how he sort of reacts in sort of situations i mean i think it'll definitely be interesting when we sort of figure out sort of like how Hinerva, um you know is sort of like keeping track of things you know through her sort of portal thing um and you know now knows where everything sort of is i think that'll be you know one of the key sort of elements that later on you know helps us to sort of get you know lotor's sort of like true sort of ambitions and true sort of goals later on the line mm, yeah i i think a big question is going to be like how lotor reacts like as time goes on and allura is going to reveal all these secrets that she's learned and she's suddenly going to be able to do all this alchemy that Lotor had the potential to do himself and mm -hmm. admittedly you know they, he'd always set it up that like you are the one who has the potential to help me with my plan to bring peace to the Empire which is um, his plan is that basically the, the Galar Empire runs on quintessence and the reason they operate the way they do right now which is very militaristic and then it's kind of soaking planets dry, taking out the life force, is because that's the only way they can get enough quintessence to run the empire and keep them all alive. So Lotor's idea is that if we can just get unlimited energy, that solves every problem, and suddenly we don't need to be at war with anyone. Um, 
now is that too idealistic um is he still underestimating the kind of reality between realities and so on probably yes because um i can see them this this is probably how they reintroduced the kind of uh evil energy thing that possessed Zarkon and uh, Onerva mm -hmm. I can see Lotor getting possessed and that being like how they deal with it again um, as a kind of plot point and that may be how Lot Lotor goes evil because I, I think at the moment the only reason I'm doubting Lotor is because I feel he'll maybe be a little bit jealous of Allura in that he's he has to use her for everything and there's not as much that he can do himself, but uh, th th they could go any direction with him. I think I think is the main thing. But I I, I do fundamentally think he is um, he has the right like idea about things, but he's not a perfect character. I think as we see, he he still has a little bit of Zarkon in him and a little bit of his mother, so kind of suffers from those kind of weaknesses. Um, so that's uh, that. Uh, the next plot point I think I'll bring up, um, I suppose because it's more like on its own and not connected to everything, um, let's go for Keith uh, meeting his mother, uh, Kralia, here. And kind of like the Sam Holt thing, this happened very, very randomly that like it's not some amazing quest that he goes on to find her, it's directly the Blades of Marmora tell him to go in and get this spy out from Lord Randveg's kind of uh, base who she's spying on and the reveal comes out while they're in there that she's in charge because Randveg is killed earlier on in the season and she has the control of his secret weapon and she uses that knowledge to get herself and Keith out and the reveal they just end, the, end on basically the reveal that I am your mother by virtue of her saying, you know, I gave this to your father that used to be mine, thus Kralia is Keith's mother type thing. We don't get anything more than that. I think maybe Keith was beginning to piece it together because uh, she was able to control his sword. But um, this is going to be very interesting because um, the Blades the entire time have kind of been like telling Keith, you're not meant to be emotional on these missions, you're not meant to care all that much about you know specific people they're very much like if someone has to die in a mission so be it but Keith has still been doing things the Team Voltron way as much as possible uh, stopping the attack on the Kral Zera in the previous episode um, and here probably as we'll see maybe he'll be protective of his mother we'll see that his mother will be protective of him and this is going to be potentially what leads him out of the blades and maybe back into team voltron depending on what they're going to do i'm very very interested to see where they go with things from here in that i do think this is probably the beginning of keith shifting away from just being a blade but um what were your thoughts on how they did keith and his mother this reveal suddenly happening here yeah it's definitely definitely wasn't at least i don't think there was any sort of real sort of precursor to like this coming out as mother i mean the episode itself you know it, it focused you know i mean i guess suitably it, it focused on you know her character just because she was sort of the spy in there and it just seemed you know it just seemed like they were focusing on Kralia, you know so much in this episode that you know something was going to sort of come out about her now i definitely I definitely didn't sort of expect it to be sort of his mother or anything like that, maybe at least until like sort of you start to see her sort of like interact with him. Um, but that's, you know, near the end of the episode. So everything happens by the end of the episode anyway at that point. So then definitely, yeah, you can see that something was up. But it's definitely something that I wasn't sort of expecting. And you no, know, they definitely do sort of just like cut it off at the end of this episode and do a whole different sort of, you know, topic um, for the for the last episode. So it's definitely, you know, it's an interesting way that they go about it. And I'm, you know, I'm sure that in the next episode once they're all sort of gathered together they'll you know there'll be some more sort of discussion about it um no i don't know, it makes me sort of wonder you know why the blade specifically sort of like sent him on this sort of mission um you know no i mean i don't know maybe they knew about it i would guess that they probably know a lot more than they would be letting on um but i don't know it's definitely it definitely seems like it's a setup for later things on and i don't know if this would be one of the things that would set him, you know, to go 
you know, farther away from the Blades of Memora. I mean, yeah, their their tactics do seem, you know, a bit harsh compared to like sort of what Voltron does, but you know, they definitely are, you know, pretty, you know, for the most part effective in what they're doing. Um, you know, they have survived this long, so you know, that does speak to something. Um, so I don't know. It may just you know, it may just push Keith to go out and do things on his own, maybe away from both Team Voltron and the Blaze more. Um, I don't know. It definitely could go a couple different ways here. But yeah, it's definitely gonna be interesting to see how he reacts to this and you know, just how the team and everyone else reacts to this. Um, I think that could definitely be really interesting. Mm, yeah, I I thought the other factor here is just I'm thinking back to season two when the Blaze were first introduced and we got the first tease of Keith. Uh, learning about his uh, heritage and he was given the 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 choice was basically like die or wait wait l- learn the truth about your mother and die or um just join the blade i can't remember the specifics but it was this really weird kind of like desperate choice he had to make and like the red line came in to kind of save him from being killed because he made this choice making it sort of believed like that the blades like they don't like the their members to know their family or something like this um obviously it, at the time it was meant to be this thing of like your old family doesn't matter your new family team voltron is all that matters and that was the the decision he had to make but now he is learning this stuff about himself obviously we know he's part galra already from the like season one reveal i think that he got hit with some quintessence and his skin went kind of purple so that's obviously going to be a thing um and overall this is probably just going to help keith be himself a little bit more and and we'll see where we we go from here because the problem with keith as the leader of voltron was that he always felt that he was below shiro and there was always a lack of confidence so this could help him get past that depending on what they do with it but Um, It definitely seems like this is a season 6 thing, this is going to be a big focus, and I'm interested to see where they go with it. Um, The other plot point here is um, Ranveg's weapon. It seems to be pretty clearly a setup for like some sort of an enemy they're going to face. Um, It's revealed that it's not like a just mechanical weapon, it's actually like a biological weapon, that it's actually a thing. In that she gives it over to Trug, but it's actually more of like she's giving Trug over to it in that it's clear that it killed her and then it's this crazy powerful monster thing that had to be kept behind like 20 doors um do you have any thoughts on what they're gonna do with this uh secret weapon yeah no i'm i definitely can see that coming out as sort of like you know something that team voltron has to fight against in in the near future um no i don't know it's you know the way that they have it set up it seems almost like sort of like one of those like uncontrollable type beasts so i mean if it's you know if it's sort of like regulated to just like one random planet then it's like how is it going to sort of like affect them in sort of like the larger scope of things but you know maybe it has you know sort of more intelligence than we're sort of like led to believe in sort of our first you know sort of initial you know seeing of it on screen here so it definitely you know it definitely looks like something that could be pretty interesting but there's not there's not too much at least that i can think of right now that they can sort of that can sort of explain how it's going to sort of come into sort of the bigger picture unless it's something that sort of like you know like hagar sort of like goes and gets and sort of uses it in some sort of way i definitely could be see it being used somehow that way but with it being sort of a secret and them leading us to believe that not many people actually know about his sort of like existence right now or maybe they will now um no it's not something that would easily be usable by most people Mm. because it's interesting in that like uh, Kralia gives it sort of an origin story of like um Ranveg kind of captured this shipment of like super high energy quintessence and Mm -hmm. there was like something special about it something unexpected that like it had a reaction on something or other um, so it probably like infected some sort of an animal and that's what it is um, the other thing is that it, it seems quite small uh, like it doesn't seem like it's a, like a giant Voltron sized thing so um, unless it can like shape shift or something like that it could be an interesting thing to have like a Voltron versus like a like small kind of uh, fight to see how that goes but uh, 
I'm not really sure how they go about this because it, it seems like it's just trapped up in space and a bit mindless so how do they kind of really get to it um I can sort of see maybe like Semdak or someone like gaining control over it somehow and that's where he comes back into play but uh we'll we'll have to wait and see on that but uh what's the the next topic you want to talk about um, I guess I'll sort of want to talk about, I guess, sort of two characters together or just sort of how they're they're working with each other. And that's sort of um, Lance and Cheryl in this sort of season here. I don't know. We have like, you know, we have a couple interactions with them in sort of like the Voltron sort of mind space where we can see that something, you know, again is going on with Cheryl that, you know, we've been suspecting for, for quite a while here and just sort of, you know, how he's sort of interacting with Lance in general in this season I think is kind of interesting with you know Lance getting you know slightly sort of more confident in sort of like his abilities we get to see him with his you know his broadsword um sort of like ability that he sort of has now um so I don't know, I think it's just interesting how you know it used to always be sort of like you know Keith and Shiro how they were working together as sort of one and two and now it seems like you know they're doing sort of a, a similar thing with Lance and Shiro yeah, the the I definitely appreciate the the season kind of giving Lance I think a little bit more of a focus. Um, it's not like he was like used like tons in every episode, but when they did use him, it, it felt like they were actually trying to accomplish something with him. And as you say, I, I think they're they seem to be setting him up as like here's Lance developing into the number two that Voltron needs the 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 Alpha position basically where. Alphor acknowledged that Zarkon was a better kind of military tactician, so he would lead Voltron, but Alphor would always be there as the kind of uh, right-hand man, and that seems to be what they're they're doing with Lance here. Whether it be a setup for, like, if Shiro has to go away for a while because it's not the real Shiro and Keith comes back into play, Lance is there to support whoever is the leader. Um, so I, th I thought that was actually very well... Um, done especially with the scene with like Allura getting across that like there is greatness within Lance that he has this higher potential than just being a kind of bit of a goofball and then yeah the stuff they're doing with Shiro they're finally I think fully teasing that like the the theories that we've been having in that Hagar there's a couple of mentions of like Project Coron uh, Coron or whatever it is and us I think very clearly now getting to see that Hagar can see through Shiro's eyes what Team Voltron is doing and that's one aspect of it but then I think the the big scene is when um, they have to get out of the all carry on kind of vine monster and they all have to kind of link their energy together uh, the other four paladins are there uh, in the kind of uh, world between world type thing but Shiro doesn't appear initially and then when he does, it's kind of like half Shiro, kind of like the shadow of Shiro, and it tries to talk to Lance. And then the real Shiro reveals that like he doesn't remember saying this, and he doesn't feel like himself, which begs all sort of questions of just, is it a clone? Is it a robot? Where's the real Shiro in all of this? And so <laughs> on. And if this is the case, then how is this Shiro even able to pilot the Black Line and, and, and all this sort of stuff? Um, what What is Project Kuron and, and, and so on? Um, I think it's, it's really interesting. It was not given too much attention just yet, but you can sort of feel they're on the verge of, like, giving us the full reveal about it. Um, I suppose at this point, Greg, what is your theory on, like, what's up with Shiro? What is the... It, who, what do you think the Shiro that we're dealing with right now is, I suppose, is probably the best question to start with. <laughs> yeah, that that is a, a good question. I, I'm i not really, really sure. I mean, no, I don't... I don't know. I don't think it's sort of like the whole sort of like clone thing. That seems that doesn't seem like it would fit as well, you know, in this sort of world with what they sort of have have shown us right now. But it definitely seems like you know a part of Shiro is definitely you know being sort of hidden away or unlocked or maybe you know being manipulated um, sort of somehow in the background. Like you know just the fact that we know you know Shiro was you know tampered with his arm and everything else. Um, just from you know just him being you know sort of locked away with the Garo being sort of like a, a gladiator um, in general, you know, 
they definitely have done you know enough things and we know about the whole sort of project thing that there definitely is something so i don't know I, it wouldn't be surprised to me that if it it is something like he's just sort of like not all there or like his true sort of self isn't there and i don't know you would think that maybe you know maybe matt or sam you know i don't know maybe sam wasn't with him enough to really sort of notice if anything was off with shira but you know maybe it's just something that no one has really been around him enough to really know sort of what his true his true sort of character self is or maybe you know this probably is sort of his true self but you know he's just sort of missing something key to his sort of like his person or his his being which is what sort of came out in the sort of Voltron mind space and why he wasn't really able to sort of like truly connect in there because you know we can see that he has a, a deep enough connection with the with the black line to sort of operate it but it seems like anything that requires sort of like a, a deeper connection level, you know, to, I don't know, maybe your core, your soul of your sort of character is something that Shiro can't sort of quite sort of manage yet. So there's there's definitely something, something, some key sort of element to Shiro that we haven't sort of, that he hasn't, that he either hasn't sort of unlocked himself or just is being sort of locked away by Hagger. Yeah, I, I think for me, what I go back to that I haven't seen, all that many people talking about after this season is if he's a robot if he's a clone what what would actually happen at the end of season two with shiro just disappearing like is that part of the project in some way and they, that's how they got him or was this project in place from when they had him initially like i, I suppose that that's that's the question about this project corone is it from the very start of the series, um, or is it only since season two and like the, the I suppose original Shiro that we had for the first two seasons just disappeared into nothingness? And then the the theory that I'm almost having is that like Shiro is like inside the Black Line, like he's kind of like part of the energy of the Black Line, and that's how he was able to kind of temporarily kind of like talk to Lance for like a second that like he's still there technically and that's why like a clone Shiro of some sort can pilot the black line because the real Shiro is like part of it somehow um, but they, they could go so many different directions with it and um, what we get this season is um, Hagar calls some sort of a research station and demands that I think it's uh, Project Koron stage 4 is activated and then it seems like after that point she's able to just uh, basically tap into some sort of energy and just see what Shiro is seeing so it's this weird thing where like okay it's not her she's the magic one basically within the Galra Empire so it's some sort of a scientific thing that's being activated somewhere else that is allowing this connection to happen which makes it seem somewhat like mechanical in some way so uh, activating like a signal of some sort but we just don't really have a clue um the the other factor i suppose is everyone else is beginning to have doubts about shiro there's arguments um he seems to be taking maybe more dramatic actions than they maybe expect from him before and He's maybe a little bit more grumpy than they'd expect and there's much more disagreements happening and him being a little bit rogue but not not so far where it feels like he's just trying to like sabotage the team or anything like that it's still shiro fundamentally um but there's definitely something up um so i, I suppose the, the final question with shiro is really like where do you think they're they're heading with this is this some way to once it's revealed take Shiro out of the picture for a while and maybe allow Keith to come back in and be the the Black Lines pilot or is this going to be a much bigger arc where potentially this is the real Shiro and Keith is going to be doing something else mm, that's a that's a good one <sighs> I don't know. I mean, I guess if they wanted to put Keith back into sort of like back into the lion, back into Voltron, that then that would be sort of a, a good way to go about it is to just sort of remove sort of Shiro altogether because you know, I can't really see them doing that with any other sort of character. But I don't know. It seems like they really sort of, you know, 
like focusing on sort of Shiro and he did sort of go away, you know, before. So, you know, would they sort of do the same sort of thing and have him sort of go away or, you know, have the whole team, you know, be back in mode of trying to search and sort of find him somehow, even though he's, you know, he's somewhere else. Um, so I, I don't know if they would want to sort of retread over the same sort of thing. I mean, I definitely could see them doing some sort of side thing where they, you know, they realize or he realizes himself that, you know, something isn't good and you know i could see him removing himself i guess i could see that sort of happening again just him sort of you know just sort of stepping down from things but again that's something else that they've sort of done before so i don't know how much you know repeat this sort of want to do but i don't know i think it's definitely going to have to be something just involving hagar and just sort of whatever this sort of project is whenever you know whenever i don't know I, I could just see her making some sort of move that sort of either pushes him over the edge in, in some sort of way or something that sort of makes the whole sort of team sort of takes notice and you know you know it, it seems like even though everyone sort of notices that something is sort of off about him he's still you know he still seems enough of himself um you know still on the good side that they're not sort of questioning it too much Mm, and uh, I suppose, like, from there, I think the only other thing is, like, okay, this is stage four of Project Kuron, being able to, like, see through his eyes. I think the eventual end game would obviously be that they activate a later stage and are, like, either able to directly control his actions or they can, like, activate some sort of a, like, program to, like, destroy Voltron or kill the Paladins or something like that where they just directly activate, like, Evil Shiro or something like that. Um, right now, just not knowing at all, really, what the the meaning of the project is, like, what the, the aim of it is in the first place, it's kind of hard to figure out, but it seems to be some long-forged plan to eventually, like, you know, take out Voltron from within. That That, that seems to be, like, the ultimate aim if, like, this first couple of stages of the plan are to like give give the the group back their leader but kind of slightly altered and that they're able to use him in specific ways to do specific things and but it feels like if they could do something that crazy why haven't they done it already given that Hagar has like already acknowledged that like the the Galra Empire has basically fallen as far as she's concerned and she's more going about her own ideas now and um, so did you have any thoughts on what what you think project Quran will eventually kind of re be revealed to be or like the final stages of it will be yeah um that's a good one i mean i guess you know seeing them sort of take full control over shiro or something to do with voltron i guess that would make sort of sense i mean with this seeming this plan seeming to have, you know, sort of originated from Hagar, it definitely has, you know, something to do with just sort of like Altain, sort of like, you know, the their science and their alchemy that they have and just, you know, her wanting to go, you know, so long to actually see, you know, where the, the ancients are actually from, you know, it makes me think that there is, you know, it has something maybe not to do with Voltron directly, but just sort of with the powers that you know, Altaians just have in general, which, you know, of course is coursing through Voltron, you know, along with the quintessence and just the, the ability to manipulate and sort of control it so i don't know i definitely could see it being something where you know she either gains control of it through shiro or just using him sort of as like a, a conduit basically to sort of control it or to sort of take things over i mean it doesn't seem like it has something specifically to do with i guess sort of the Golra empire as a whole as far as you know sort of like bringing them back into power it definitely seems like it's more of something that she's been sort of developing on her own maybe like i i don't know it doesn't seem like something that like zarkon per se would have been sort of involved with or even you know like lotar would actually know about it it definitely seems like a solo type thing um, but I don't, I don't know, because she definitely, you know, she obviously has, you know, other people who are part of the empire involved in it in some, in some way. So it's definitely, it's definitely an interesting sort of aspect that they've, you know, for the most part, have just been keeping pretty low as far as the information of what it truly is. But I guess that will probably come out pretty soon now. It seems. Mm -hmm. uh, my next talking point, I suppose, basically is is about episode four, Crawl Zera, because. Uh, this is where we get all the information on it and 
it's basically the the power vacuum within the uh, Galra Empire and how they deal with the death of Zarkon that there needs to be a new emperor and how they do it is that in within the two days following the death of the previous emperor they meet on one of the first planets the Galra Empire ever captured um, and uh, the planet Fiev I think or Five um, and they go to this specific place the Kralzera it's this meeting and all the most powerful Galra in the Empire, who are potential emperors, uh, will go there and try to relight this like eternal fire of the Galra Empire. And whoever manages to do that is going to be the next emperor. And we get like a, a full list of all these characters. Uh, Warlord Ranvig, uh, Commander Nog, Quartermaster uh, Junker. Um, we get some of the other ones later on, like uh, Trug. Um, Lotor obviously puts his hand in and then one of the kind of uh, episode cliffhangers is that Hagar can't become Empress herself because she's just Altaian, she's got no Galra blood. So her candidate, her puppet, is going to be Semdak because she 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 at this point uh, gets Oxia and Zephrid and Ezor on her side to go and find him and so they bring him back and Semdak is, the, is her kind of chosen candidate to be Emperor. I really like this episode. This section of the season I thought was really well done with the kind of kind of quick kind of Galra politics kind of 101 and just making it really clear that here is a kind of um, warrior kind of empire and everyone is going to fight to become the new Emperor and I thought it just uh, it really got across the culture of the Galra Empire while also just being, I think, a very interesting plot point in that there's a lot of tension around should Voltron support Lotor being the next Emperor now that he's sort of proven himself to them? Or is this part of his bigger picture plan to just become Emperor and then he'll turn on them? And so I, I, th I thought that was this was really well done as they kind of incorporate everything. Like the Blades are on a mission here but they haven't told anyone. Uh, Shiro goes off with Lotor to do this on his own um, and it made for just a really I thought excellent episode but uh, Greg what were your thoughts on the the Kral Zera here the the I suppose election of a new uh, the, the choosing of a new uh, Galra Emperor yeah no I, I think it, it definitely was a good way as you say to get sort of the the Galra sort of politics one-on-one -on -one here and you know definitely with them sort of being this warrior type race even before they you know seemingly had started this whole sort of you know battle or this whole war to sort of take over the, the universe here you know it seems like this would have been the way if not the specific you know particular sort of like action the way of them sort of determining um you know their new sort of emperor and i you know i like the fact that they do list off the ones sort of before zarkon and then they have zarkon and say you know he's like the the longest reigning one you know of course because of beat of using the sort of quintessence to keep himself alive for you know thousands of years um which is you know interesting fact in itself um so no i think it it definitely is a a cool you know setup for how they sort of you know get their leader in charge here and just seeing you know the different sort of you know this is i think this episode specifically definitely you know helped to characterize the sort of gara that we have sort of you know at least i felt that we sort of have been missing before because yeah we've met you know some sort of generals and you know some you know other sort of you know notable sort of gara type of characters um but other than sort of like the Blaze of Memora, which even then we don't really get that much on them at all. You know, we don't really have, you know, we don't really know how the Gara all sort of like interact with each other other than, you know, when they're sort of vying for power, which of course this is, you know, just the ultimate way of sort of vying for power. But you definitely can, you know, you definitely can see, you know, how different, you know, the characters, like you can see that, you know, not all of them are all about the sort of battling and things. Some of them are more sort of like organizing things and using their smarts to do things where we see with the quartermaster which of course doesn't help him sort of win anything in the end um but you know you, you at least you get to see different type of you know personalities within this sort of empire so i think it, it definitely sort of helps that and yeah it's definitely it's just a a cool sort of battle episode in general because you just you know you have you know the planet almost sort of or you know, the temple itself being almost sort of blown up and you know keith sort of being involved in there so no i mean 
for one part, I thought it it would have been interesting if Keith, you know, somehow got like the flame and threw it down in there since, you know, he does have blood. So in theory, he could actually be, you know, the emperor of the empire. So, you know, that would have been interesting if that sort of would have happened. But no, I think it's it's definitely an interesting way of sort of showing how this is, you know, how they sort of, you know, choose their leader and how, you know, even though Lortar did get the flame in, you know, it's not like everyone is sort of like automatically sort of accepting him um, just sort of right off the bat. There de definitely are, you know, different fractions that sort of aren't going to accept his rule or, you know, I think that would almost happen with whoever sort of, you know, came into power. They would definitely have to, you know, by show of force, you know, just because of how the Gara sort of design, you know, show that they have to be, that they're the one who are, you know, sort of in charge and no one should sort of question them. So no, I think this, this definitely was one of the, the highlight episodes for me out of this short season here. Mm, yeah, it really helped to just give a lot of extra information on like the, the culture, the history of the Galra Empire and that I, I think we tend to always be like, okay, this is the this is like a warrior focused culture that's kind of been taken over by like technology and magic kind of combined and that that's what like the the higher up scene with the whole quintessence thing. But it's clear that like this specifically is something that has been with them since this the inception of like the Galra even before it, be, it was just the Empire so it's cool that they kind of went through the full history of like there's been I think to mention here there's been 33 different rulers it's been uh, the Galra have existed for like 13 millennia so like that's 3,000 years before they started this kind of full-on Empire they mentioned that like someone called Brogar I think is the first leader then there was like someone called Frigg the Great um, and I, I just like that, that this is something that they have that hasn't been changed by like the, the new era. This is still how they like elect a, a ruler, which to me made it a little bit weird with the blades being so willing to like just destroy this thing, given that technically this is part of their history. And if they, I, I suppose we don't know enough about the blades to know like how they specifically feel about even... Galra history before the Empire or not so it just felt a little bit weird that they were so willing to just destroy something that seems to actually be one of the few things that the Galra have kept from their earliest eras and I get it from like a perspective of just like they're just out to take out the people who represent the Empire as, as easily as possible but um, uh, I suppose that's just some of the underdevelopment on the blades specifically um, but uh, as, as, as we discussed here, uh, it was really, really well done. Um, do you have any specific thoughts about the return of uh, Semdak, who... It was season one, wasn't it, when they kind of got rid mm. of him? Um, as, in that I felt like this, this was the episode where they kind of retroactively went back and went... Actually, you know, he was one of the most powerful Galra. He was like Zarkon's right-hand right man. Um he just didn't get to fully display his powers back then, but he is actually one of the best. Whereas I think before this, you could almost go back and like, oh yeah, Semdak was just one of the random ones like we've had since then. Um, but uh, did you, I suppose, feel any sort of excitement for seeing the character return, or were you just kind of like, cool reference to a character we've seen before? Hmm. I don't know. I wasn't sort of that sort of excited. I think it was cooler, like, once you sort of get to see him sort of in action, just because, you know, it definitely seemed like, you know, I mean, he, not that he was that bad before, but, you know, the fact that he was just, you know, sort of like, you know, at one point was just sort of fighting Shiro um, on almost sort of like a, a level sort of basis, even though now, you know, he's more amped up or whatever. Um, so, I don't know, definitely, you no, know, I guess it's a cool reference to have back just because he's a character that we know. We know that he actually, you know, he does have some of his own sort of like aspirations, even if now he is sort of like, you know, the pseudo sort of puppet for Hagar. Um, and at least now, I guess we know he took over the, um, the quartermaster's um, sort of like, I guess his sort of like part of the, the empire or whatever. So, you know, he does have some forces behind himself on his own now, so maybe he'll sort of like branch out and not even have to deal with sort of Hagar. So, you know, now he's, he'll probably be a more sort of interesting role type character now, um, depending on how 
they use him later on. But I don't know. I think it was cool to see him in here. I mean, he did have a, a pretty cool battle with Lotar. You know, you definitely get to see you know, his sort of abilities, how, you know, on par he is, um, you know, with sort of like the other sort of, you know, characters. Um, so, no, I think it's, it's definitely a cool one. It definitely wasn't something that I was like over the top sort of excited about. But, you know, it is cool to bring back a character that we do actually sort of know about. Yeah, and the, and the interesting thing is, like, we're introduced to all of these characters, but they kill off basically all of them. Ranveig is killed um, by um, Semdak. Uh, Junker is killed by Semdak. Um, uh, Trog kills Lazdok up in space before the monster kills her, so those two are taken out. I think the only other character they mentioned that we didn't really see die was Commander... Knog, but was he the one who tried to assassinate Hagar and then she killed him? That's what I thought. Okay, okay, so so he's potentially dead as well, which means that Semdak is actually like the only other, I suppose, big faction left, because as you say, he takes over Junker's fleet, and the way to describe Junker is that he himself isn't particularly powerful, but he had a fleet where he could just like swipe his finger and they take over everything so um, <laughs> that puts uh, Semdak in a very powerful position so th- that could be a cool thing to see like uh, the faction Semdak's faction kind of fighting against Lotor and uh, depending on if they introduce anything else you know we, we could really see some cool stuff come out of that so I, I think it's going to be a net benefit like once it all kind of uh, all the details comes out in terms of like how many other factions are out there? Is there anyone else bigger than Semdak? Or is it just going to really come down to Semdak is the main one who disagrees with Lotor as ruler? Because my interpretation is that Hagar more or less kind of gives up on like uh, trying to pick someone else for the throne and that her own personal goal of um, getting to... Um, what's the name of the place again? Um, Oriande... Uh, has kind of taken over everything and she doesn't really care as much about who specifically is ruling the Galra Empire anymore um but uh I I I don't know but was that was that your interpretation as well that Semdak is very much kind of on his own now and Hagar is 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 kind of doing her own separate thing as well definitely seems that way I mean I don't know, this seems like the fact that Hagar was searching for this place, Harion, for like, you know, I guess forever, basically, um, makes it seem like this is like her, her only sort of priority here. And you know, I think with him having his fleet, like, he doesn't need to rely on Hagar for like having her sort of like backing to sort of, you know, take his foothold into sort of like the Empire here. It seems like he, you know... Unless, you know, he's doing this, you know, all this part on her request and she's going to sort of come back into play after all this, um, you know, it definitely seems like, well, at least to me that they sort of have been able to sort of like separate themselves, at least for now. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose a quick, uh, small talking point, uh, kind of going back to the, the, the fighting on the Crawl's era thing, we see that Keith kind of gets involved in it as well, like when they're on their steps and uh, I think it's that... Uh, uh, Laznok character who nearly takes out Keith when he loses his sword but then Oxia kind of just randomly comes in to defend Keith Um, it's obviously I think meant to be taken as like her returning the favor to Keith for um, him saving her from being inside the weblum in like season 2 I think it was or maybe 3 Um, but do you think they're setting up um, Oxia and Keith for anything more than that or is this just a directly like return the favor for saving me from earlier on I don't know it didn't seem like they were setting up much else to me only because they haven't had you know much or if any sort of interaction sort of since then so I don't know I guess if she were to do something else after this then I might sort of you know assume that they're trying to set up something else between them um, but yeah no I didn't really see too much more yeah, because because the fandom is really like reading into this and like there's is it huh. there's, there's, the the two factions are either that um, uh, Oxia is Kralia's daughter, which means that like Oxia would be Keith's uh. sister somehow because they sort yeah. of look alike, or that eventually Oxia will be like set up as like 
Keith Oxia as like a ship kind of romantic yeah, thing at some yeah point. that makes sense um, I'm not really sure what way I, I lean on that I, I'm definitely kind of waiting to see if there's anything next time they actually meet because as far as I'm aware they haven't really said a word to each other um, just yet outside of Keith realising that it's her from the weblum and now this returning the favour thing this is all we have but um uh, there, there, there's there's potential going forward. I, I think as the seasons have gone on, I think we were initially like, how old is Oxia? I, I think she is kind of more in her around like Keith's age. So I don't. I think a romance could be something potentially, depending on where they go. But Oxia obviously right now is not really on the right side for that to happen, and I don't think she's got the character development to to justify it either. But um, yep, yeah, shippers are gonna obviously ship and. Anything, anything they see that has potential is going to happen. Um, <laughs> and I'm not sure about the family thing, just because I think that would overcomplicate something that already feels quite complicated. Um, but um, what's uh, your next uh, talking point? Um, I don't know. I guess I'll just jump on that little thing. Just, I guess, just a little or the lack, I don't know if that's even a bad thing, but just, I guess, just sort of romance sort of aspects since, you know, we were just talking about shipping. Um, I mean, I can't think of too much of it at all in this episode. I mean, we have the little bit with um, Pigeon Hunk with, um, you know, her dad. That was like a nice little bit there. And I guess maybe, you know, they could try to set up something, or at least they could set up some sort of thing with, um, you know, Allura and Lortor, um, just because, you know, it seems like just because they've been around each other so much, um, you know, in the, specifically more so in the last sort of episode here. Um, but other than that, I don't know. I don't really see anything that much. I mean, I don't know. It just seems like this is one of those things that this show just really isn't sort of as focused about as, you know, we've seen from other shows from, you know, these creators um, specifically. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Th- uh, yeah. I think I- I'd say definitely overall the show in terms of just really clear direct romance hasn't had that much uh hunk and shay is basically it i think in terms of like stuff that they've directly like set up that yeah those two realistically are more or less a couple other than that it's just kind of like pairing characters who seem to like each other like there's one-sided ones like lance obviously likes allura that's yeah. very very clear um i do think there is potential for Allura Lotor in that she now seems to trust him completely and is kind of placing a lot of importance and and she seems to kind of now be beginning to buy into the fact that like this is like a I suppose kind of like Avatar like this new generation of like an Avatar and a Fire Lord a new generation of like the the royalty of like uh, Galra and uh, Altea um, yeah. she, she's kind of buying into that now and Lance obviously reacted to the alliance as if it was more or less like this marriage proposal type thing. So they, there was a sort of tease towards that. Um, Hunk and Paige, like, yes, but I suppose in their dynamic, I'm not really seeing it right now. Um, and then other stuff, I suppose, like, the other ones that I think people ship are Shiro and Allura, but they didn't really seem to lean towards that at all this season, just because of it, I think... Shiro's arc more or less I think takes him out of any shipping thing for the most part and then Keith and Allura was I think one in season three or four I think I think it was three that was they were maybe leaning towards because they had a few kind of intense conversations but that he's been so separate I'm not really sure if I can even like lean into that so it's one of those things where like a lot of the main characters I don't think there really is anything so Allura Lotor and then Hunk Shay is kind of, I think, really the main ones. Um, I think the creators more or less confirmed that, like, we will see romance at some point. I don't know how much of it or anything like that they seem to be hinting towards, but that there would be some, which uh, I'm all for because just they haven't done much just now. Um, uh, but I suppose, uh, what are your thoughts on, I suppose, some of the key ships that are out there and, like, what do you think makes sense that could happen? 
Yeah, I mean, I think as you've broken it down, those are probably the most sort of like obvious ones. I mean, just the whole idea of just having a lore with lore tar, just with you know them being sort of like the rules of their sort of nations or what's left of their nations. You know, it sort of makes sense as far as that being like a setup type thing. But I could see that just sort of you know with whatever it does eventually happen with Lotar, just that sort of like, you know, basically breaking lore down completely. So I don't know, maybe they could use it towards that sort of way. That definitely would be sort of a, a heartbreaking thing to see on, on the lore side, um, especially with everything that, you know, she seemingly has been through with Lotar now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know, it just seems like it's definitely just not one of the focuses right now, which I guess, you know, kind of makes sense. But, you know, there's always time for things to sort of happen later down on the line. Yeah, and then I suppose the new ones from this season are kind of, um, you know, Oxia and Keith, kind of, is something that people seem to like, um, and I don't know if there's really anything else. Um, I suppose there's some people out there. I, I suppose we, we also have uh, Matt likes Allura as well. I think we, we got that in oh, last yeah. season as well, but that's very one-sided again. Um, other than that... Um, I suppose Rollo and Naima are technically a couple. I think in their initial episode, they reveal, I think, that they were a couple. So there's a ship, but I don't think people care too much about that. <laughs> um, so that's that. Um, I suppose one of the last talking points I have is, I suppose getting into the uh, Oriande kind of arc, basically the last episode, Um it's an interesting one, and um, we, we get a, a good amount of kind of setup, I suppose, before we go into it, of um, Lotor giving Allura the confidence to, I suppose, give them the means to find it. She kind of connects with um, the kind of compass stone thing and activates it, which reveals the location. And then they get there, and it's this uh, kind of mysterious location hidden in a white hole, which is a kind of celestial object that they introduce, and they initially try to wormhole inside it's got this white line protector kind of energy spirit thing inside that uh, shuts down the castle shuts down Voltron which puts a lot of pressure on Allura to make this happen in that they more or less say that the only way to fix this situation is for Allura to gain the Altaian alchemy gain this control over energy to repower up everything again and so uh, Lotor and Allura have to go inside because they are chosen because they have the correct Altaian blood and are, their, their markings light up. Uh, Lotor is suddenly revealed to have these markings as well, which is interesting. Um, uh, it, it was surprising that it kind of happened so suddenly, but it made sense to kind of give him those markings to show his kind of dual heritage. Um, and... I, I suppose just uh, on that first section there, the, the kind of convincing right up until they kind of make it into Orion, what were your thoughts on uh, kind of the, the setup for this so far with like the white hole and the the, the white line protector thing? Um, I think that's you no. Know, I think that was pretty cool. I mean, just how they how they have that all set of set up, and just you know the fact that it is you know basically you know how Al Four sort of like created the lines, and I guess you just get to see sort of you know you get, before you get any of the specific sort of information of the actual sort of like secrets and stuff being in there, you get sort of like hints and stuff of it, and the fact that we get to see sort of like you know who the two chosen ones are and how they sort of explain you know how Koran doesn't actually have you know sort of that sort of specific technical you know i guess you know sort of magical sort of ability heritage to actually sort of get into there um you know i think that's actually pretty cool and you know just the fact that they do make it you know a bit more sort of dire with them sort of being out of power um i think is is definitely interesting and just sort of how you know it's definitely how they just set up the two pair of them to sort of go on this sort of like solo mission um i think it is interesting Mm -hmm. And then uh, the the second half of this, when they get in, is kind of like they they climb up a mountain. Um, Lotor actually reveals something quite interesting here. He basically reveals why he was banished in the first place, because he was introduced as like returning from his banishment. I think Hagar had him return from his banishment, uh, and we find out why that happened. Um, his father put him in charge of a planet for a year. Um, but instead of doing things the usual Galra way by basically just taking over command, um, complete kind of I am the ruler, 
and just sucking the planet dry of its energy, he worked with the leadership of that planet and only took what energy could be replenished, um, as we've kind of learned about from before. Um, you can take energy, but as long as like there's a way for the, the planet or whatever to return that energy, it's actually okay. And he actually enjoyed the experience and learned a lot from the, the culture of this planet. But when um, Zarkon found out, he basically, this is what led to Lotor's banishment. Uh, he initially told Lotor to destroy the planet, but he didn't. So Zarkon did it himself. And so this kind of good thing from Lotor of trying to do things differently led to a whole kind of planet culture being destroyed. And it, it ends up being this, I think, notable moment for Allura where she begins to understand Lotor better in that it's a perfect example that like Lotor is different than Zarkon and uh, which I thought it was a really good kind of backstory um, d did you like this kind of backstory for explaining the banishment yeah no I think that was actually pretty good how they actually did that and you know definitely you know this is the one of the points where you're like oh okay maybe Lotar isn't such a bad guy but of course you know depending on you know how old we're t saying this this was like you know hundreds if not thousands of years ago so since then he's been doing all this other sort of bad stuff so it's like yeah he he has the potential to be you know a good guy but it's, it's definitely sort of like outweighed by everything else he's sort of had to do after the fact even if it wasn't you know originally his own sort of intentions mm -hmm. uh, they head they finally find the uh, I suppose main kind of castle area basically they head inside um, the, there's a room where the ceiling is going to collapse but Allura uses her kind of like like she does with the teledav to kind of uh, activate it um, there's a moment before that where they encounter these kind of like stone guardians that like they talk about as like the, the life givers the original alchemists and Allura uses the um, the the compass stone to to let them pass and and, and show that they're worthy. But uh, when she activates this room with the uh, the ceiling, they're separated and basically put into like a a quintessence kind of uh, astral projection kind of area, where they were together, but now they're separate. But they're both basically doing the exact same thing. They're confronted by this kind of. Uh, white lion basically which is aggressive towards them and initially they both dodge it and don't know what to do um lotor though when it really breaks gets down to it decides that he has to fight back and is not just going to let this uh, white lion kill him and so takes out his sword and cuts the lion down um, and as he kind of basically screams the galra thing which I suppose it was kind of meant to show him reverting back to a bit of the standard Galra thing to show that he hasn't fully moved on past that. Um, and what happens is that uh, he's immediately sent outside of the, the whole kind of structure that they went into. Allura, though, decides that she's trying to gain these secrets of life, so she should have to give up her own life to get them, and so allows herself to be hit by the wolf but instead the wolf kind of goes inside of her and I suppose grants her the um, the secrets and uh, she gets this really cool like almost avatar state type kind of moment where like she's like in the cosmos and like uh, <laughs> this like uh, ethereal voice speaks to her and calls this like the realm of her ancestors that she's home it says that the secrets already within her and that uh, they will now I suppose like embrace her because she's returned home and that's about all we really get for that. We, we get that Allura has gained some sort of a knowledge when she returns back and is able to reactivate the ship. But we don't know the full extent of like what it means that like Lotor failed his test and what it means that Allura has passed hers. Um, I, I don't put like too much like Lotor is evil just because he attacked the lion type thing. I do put it more of just like this is always going to be this like personal failure for Lotor that he he couldn't move past his own like uh, heritage and eventually like uh, had to rely on kind of uh, his old ways instead of I suppose who he wants to be and it's it's more it's less this like evil thing of now he only can use Allura and more of like he's going to be very disappointed with himself for failing this in, in 
and maybe it will lead him to doing some bad things in terms of using Allura skills, but um, I, 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 it's a bit of a debate, I suppose, within the fandom about, like, are we meant to fully, like, not trust Lotor, or should we trust Lotor, and how much of that should you do because of these little things here and there? Um, I suppose I'm leaning more right now towards, like, I think he is a fundamentally good character, but he's always going to make these mistakes because of, like, where he came from and his heritage, who his father is, and also um, who his mother is, and the whole, like, uh, crazy quest for quintessence, I suppose, potentially leading him astray, like it led her astray. Um, but uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the the two fights, the two different fights here we see with the White Wolf, and I suppose what they mean? Yeah, it definitely is a, a interesting sort of uh, compare and contrast between the two of them and just seeing, you know, how one was raised versus the other as far as, you know, their, their Altaian sort of history here, which, you know, I guess it, it doesn't really surprise me too much that, you know, Lutor would sort of go sort of the more aggressive sort of combat sort of way in this sort of situation here um, just because of, you know, everything that he has sort of had to go through. And yeah, I definitely could see it as something that he'll sort of like keep it very like close to himself that he sort of like failed this test but you know i definitely can see it coming up later on as a as a point of just sort of you know why he chooses to do something sort of later on versus you know what you know he should actually sort of do um definitely could see him using it sort of as like a crutch or like an excuse if you know something doesn't go you know sort of the way that he originally thought it would be um but i don't know i guess I don't know, I mean, I guess I could see him still being sort of, right now, still at heart, sort of being sort of a a good type of character, you know, even though he is sort of flawed, but I don't know, it just seems like, you know, with there being sort of this sort of vacuum of sort of, I guess, a bigger sort of bad guy in the series that, you know, I definitely could see him, I still can see him easily switching back over to the other side. Like, I don't, I don't think it'll happen quickly. Like, it may take another, you know, season or half season or, or whatever for that part to actually sort of come out. But it doesn't seem like outside of the realm of possibility to me personally yet. But no, I think it's it's definitely a, a interesting way that they, they showed this. And yeah, I, I do sort of wonder when we'll sort of get more information on sort of like what the secrets actually are you know how how you know laura actually sort of uses these you know abilities that you know she's apparently had her whole time but you know hasn't had it sort of like unlocked per se so it definitely will be pretty cool to see how this is used yeah like i i think there are things like with what we saw in oriande that sort of like help to maybe explain a little bit more about like what exactly the lions are and like like how they're made in that like last season or was it season three revealed to us that like okay they're made of this um trans reality comet material and then i think a description of the lines we had from before is that like they're enhanced with quintessence but that doesn't quite explain why they're sort of sentient and given that the whole place is somehow related to lines and white lines and clearly alfor was here that explains the sort of lion influence and like if there's some sort of a thing where he was able to like incorporate these lion spirits from Oriande into them that's like more that kind of could explain the like three-part makeup of the lines that it's like quintessence trans reality co comet and like the spirit of some sort of a lion guardian type thing and now Allura seemingly could have the potential to make a lion if she wanted to um, which some people have been speculating about like you know we've got a few too many potential pilots here and only five seats <laughs> uh, we could use another line or something like that uh, a better backpack for Voltron or something like that um, <laughs> like you could sort of see how they, they could do it like that that white line spirit if they like incorporated that into something like there's a white line type thing um, which would sort of fit you know if you have black and then just colors for the rest of them why not also have white so there, 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 you could see there's options now that you have someone who has the same abilities as um al four seemingly um and then if keith comes back and shiro sticks around there's need potentially for another uh another pa paladin another uh line but they they could they could do anything basically with it um 
the only thing I could see with Lotor is that if Allura is able to kind of tap into the kind of uh, quintessence field and get him all the energy he wants, it could look bad for him if it's seen by everyone else as like, oh, Allura and Altain is giving the Galra Empire all the energy they need and Lotor, our leader, isn't really doing anything except accepting it. Um, that could make him look bad and like make Allura look like the one in charge rather than him and that that could create sort of a like jealousy thing um, whereas maybe if he had some some skills and he was crucial to the harvesting of the energy it would make it seem more like a, a joint effort but uh, I suppose we have to wait and see just what exactly Lotor's plan is and like if Allura will be put at risk if she's if when Lotor finally decides to actually try and harvest energy and this is obviously where we're, we're going to get into the fact that this is dangerous we could see the return of this kind of evil energy type stuff um, and so on um, plus I suppose the other reveal at the end uh, right at the end is that um, Hagar is watching them discuss the coordinates for for Oriande through Shiro and she now knows where it is and is basically saying to Oxia to like pilot them there so that's going to be an interesting thing and in that that seems to set up directly that there's potentially going to be some sort of a battle at Oriande or they'll leave as Hagar arrives and we'll probably see then if Hagar is a chosen Altaian and that could be a big thing or not and um, because she can't get through if she's not a chosen one so that would seem like that almost has to be the case but um what are your thoughts on where you think the plot is i suppose directly going to go from here given the setup do you think kagar will be a chosen one because otherwise there's no way for her to get in as we've seen yeah that's what i would think that there would be sort of like no way for her to sort of get in just because if you know we see how how much of a struggle it was for voltron to come in but like maybe she does have some sort of way that she could sort of like force herself in there or you know maybe she uses you know Shiro somehow to actually sort of force away in. I don't I don't know but I mean I don't know it doesn't seem like the it doesn't seem like the, the entrance into the space is what's really sort of the key sort of like blocking sort of guard thing like yeah you have to be chosen but it seems like if you have like enough sort of like magical sort of like heritage then you can at least sort of get into the space as long as you don't try to sort of force yourself in um now learning the actual sort of secrets and that sort of part like that might be something that she might you know struggle more so with just because she's been part of the gara empire for so long but i don't know maybe she can sort of revert back just for that sort of moment there and sort of accept it and then she'll sort of gain the knowledge i mean i don't know you would think that there would be you know some more sort of like safeguards in place for for this sort of you know situation but maybe that's just not something that would happen or maybe i don't know maybe once she's in there she's able a way to sort of like take everything down from the outside i don't i don't really know but i think you know regardless of what happens the fact that she she knows that this place exists is gonna you know give her some some extra ideas or something more that she can sort of use either for the gout or uh, empire or just for her own sort of you know her own sort of means and her own sort of purpose so it definitely is gonna be you know interesting how she uses this power Mm, yeah, and the other thing that this means, like with these characters potentially like coming together, is that we know Allura and Hagar have kind of had some kind of notable kind of confrontations before. I think season two finale was where Hagar tried to use her magic on Allura, and that was when Allura got her like kind of purple shield kind of counter magic thing that we didn't really have a clue at the time what it was. Um, and that was when Allura found out for the first time that Hagar is Altaian, which I think what which I think that was meant to inform why she came up with the theory of that Anerva and Hagar are the same person, which Lotor obviously can't bring himself to even in any way accept at this point. So I think that could be a, a plot point that they cover in the early episodes as well. Lotor accepting that Hagar is his mother and some sort of a reveal or emotional reaction happening because of that and probably Allura Hagar facing off again just to see how their magic versus her kind of alchemy energy powers kind of face off so it, it, it feels like it's sort of 
writes itself in a way how like some of these confrontations could play out or at least interesting ideas could happen but uh do you have any uh thoughts on that do you think they'll commit to doing those reveals early season six or will they maybe have the two groups kind of miss out on each other kind of just at the start Mm. I, don't know, I think it would be cool if they sort of meet up um, right in the beginning of the season just because we know that she's on the route but I don't know with the way that they sort of do the, the travel and the space and everything here and I don't know with the fact that you know they could just sort of like essentially like warp out of there now that they have the power I could see them easily sort of not crossing paths um, immediately until sort of like later on um, I don't know I definitely don't know about the whole sort of like reveal with Lotar and sort of Minerva or Hagar sort of being revealed as his mother sort of that early on it seems like they would need I don't know they definitely sort of need a reason to be sort of like face to face in the same place which I'm sure they can set that up if they haven't already sort of figured out how that's going to all sort of pan out um, so I definitely that's definitely going to be pretty interesting to see how he accepts it I mean that could be one of those things that just sort of pushes him back towards you know the Galra side of things versus doing you know what he's currently sort of doing um so i don't know it's, there's definitely a lot of possibilities for that mm, yeah it's it's definitely um an interesting one they, they could do a lot of stuff there um i suppose the other question i have uh, i probably have to watch the season again but like do do we see uh, the two uh, Lotor created uh, trans reality comet ships in this season? Does Oxia and her team still have them, or do we not know the location of those two ships? That's a good one. I thought they still had it, but yeah. The, the only thing that's making me doubt that is just because like they were like banished from the Empire, and then they just got back in, and then they were using like different transports to like do yeah. different things. Uh, I assume they still have them, but uh, they never really referenced them all that much. Uh, I suppose they could always bring them back if they are going to commit to bringing back another line. They could combine them somehow. And yeah, like that. that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, like that. I mean, they already have the materials sort of like set up and ready. It just has to be manipulated into like another line essentially, and it is made of the same material. So there you go. Mm. Yep. Uh, but let's see. Uh, do you have any other talking points? Um, no, I think my list at least is out. Yeah, I think I'm for the most part out as well. Um, let me see here. This little Karian episode. Um, I, I I know some people were sort of complaining about the season that like, oh, we didn't get to see a lot of big Voltron fights. It was the the vine creature thing on Alcarion, the first episode mm -hmm. sort of had a fight scene and then it was just kind of like uh, montages of just Voltron destroying stuff. But uh, I don't know, for, for, for me, I, I found the the third episode, the fight to be like a little kind of overlong. The same with like the first episode to a degree, like starting off with just kind of like a five minute action sequence that mainly just was there to show that like, oh, here's correct advice from Lotor he's correct and um, I, I found that like I don't need that much action because I don't think the show needs to have like a giant action sequence every single episode because if, if it was like that then it would be more like a typical like Voltron Power Rangers show where it's just uh, fight monster <laughs> on the ground monster grows big get in Voltron defeated and that's every single episode I appreciate that we have episodes that don't really need to feature Voltron fighting all the time that we can have like an episode that's just about Galra politics and the different Galra leaders fighting each other with maybe Voltron being a, a key factor in how it all comes to an end right at the end and stuff like that but um, do you have any sort of issues like that with the series maybe not having the big Voltron versus a giant enemy fight as much? Not particularly. Um, I mean, you know, we do get to see it a little bit, but I mean, I don't know, I think anytime we have them either fighting as Voltron or just have them sort of fight in, in the lines sort of in space, that sort of like, you know, that satisfies my need to see like the giant sort of like robot, the robot sort of like type fight sort of stuff. Um, you know, I like sort of, 
I like the fact that they have, you know, more of the sort of characterness, you know, parts of the character of the show and the series and just getting to know them and sort of, you know, understanding, you know, how our characters interact with each other. I think, you know, maybe that was just happens to be the more focus of this, you know, half season per se in general. I mean, I don't know, I definitely could see, you know, them sort of picking back up with more sort of battles in the in the second half of this season or season six or however you want to sort of like break it up. Um so I don't know, I think it's you sort of have to gauge it over like the two the two half seasons sort of together as far as you know how many big sort of robot battles you actually sort of get here and you know it's also just what are they going to fight in Voltron because I mean Voltron is you know it's, it's pretty powerful on its own so you know as soon as you bring it out you know you're pretty much done with whatever the threat is because you know if that if Voltron can't defeat whatever it is you're going against then you know it's pretty much over at that point. Um, I mean, it can still struggle and it still can have, you know, some issues. I mean, even in episode three, it was sort of, you know, captured for a good amount of time there. And, you know, you're sort of wondering how they're sort of going to get around it because, you know, it did have a, a good sort of, you know, enemy to go against with the whole like monster sort of creature as well as just the vines sort of affecting everything. So, you know, that was sort of a, a good chance to sort of see Voltron actually have a challenge to go against. Um, but yeah, so I don't know, I think for me it, it sort of works out with how they're sort of balancing it right now. Um, otherwise, yeah, it, it sort of would get very quickly sort of more sort of like Power Rangers like robot of the sort of episode type battle thing. I mean, you know, they, they always show the whole sort of like, you know, sequence for them sort of combining together, which I always sort of get somewhat sort of tired of that after a while, even if it doesn't happen in every episode. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you sort of wish that, like, if they're doing a combined sequence, like, can it not just, like, happen as part of the regular animation and we just see that, like, oh, Paige is over here, so she's, like, approaching the combine from, like, a slightly different angle and we just see yeah. Voltron form naturally instead of having to go, like, inside and see the different parts connect of just, no, can we let just do, like, a sequence of them, like, forming like upside down or like sideways because of whatever way they're flying and make it a bit more dynamic um i get it's i suppose meant to be like a, a sort of reference to have the kind of a stock animation thing for the combiner sequence yeah. but uh I, I i hope they they do a, a, a kind of in animation combined sequence at some point but uh we're, we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that um I suppose the only other plot point we really didn't cover was just the kind of fun plot point for this season, which is when they they go to like a, the Galra base and uh, Paige, Lance, and Hunk are sent to just like look around with a, a sentry escort kind of bot, and they immediately reprogram it to understand fun, and they just have like crazy adventures where they basically annoy two of the guards that are also following them. Um, I thought this was actually. Uh, pretty well done to just kind of have them messing around with this bot it didn't there was only like two or three scenes with it but it was actually really funny and uh, well done when they used it the the fact that the the bot was like it, it kind of like embodied fun to the point where like it was coming up with better ideas than they were like firecrackers and food goo and then it going as far as to basically like kill itself in the pursuit of fun by like strapping itself to one of the robe beast coffins as they fired it out and it's like they salute it as it's like one of the most beautiful fireworks show ever and um, i thought this was like much better than like say like the voltron show being like the kind of sort of fun episode from like last season uh, i actually quite liked how they did this but uh, what, what were your thoughts on i suppose the more kind of comedic side plot for this season yeah, no, I think that one was actually pretty good just because they had, you know, other things going on at the same time. Like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't so, so dedicated to just that sort of, you know, part of, you know, just that sort of experience. You know, we did have this more sort of serious stuff with Allure and Lortor sort of finding things out about, you know, sort of Hagar's, you know, sort of, you know, all of her objects. So I think, you know, 
that definitely sort of helped as far as you know to ease the fact that you know you would think that you know if this was like a whole episode or even like a half of an episode like maybe like with um the space mall episode or something like that and yeah even that one has sort of a purpose it it almost seems like it's one of those like filler type episodes or part filler sort of episodes this one felt like it was just you know just some other characters doing something else you know they were supposed to you know they were supposed to be exploring the base which they are but you know they're having fun about sort of doing it so it's not so so sort of throwing you off there as them just you know doing something completely like useless and sort of random um so no i think that was a, a good way of balancing it out mm-hmm. so uh yeah i guess we'll we'll just do some final thoughts and then kind of wrap this uh, podcast up um i think for me overall I, as i said at the start i i really like this season i think it accomplished a lot it uh obviously had the big reveals of like uh here's sam holt we get him back uh, and while it wasn't, like, they never made it, I think, the most important plot. I think it le- it'll lead to good stuff in the future in that, like, Earth kind of is going to get some information now and it's going to be somewhat prepared for when we get back to it, which I think they sort of needed to do. I think it'd be a bit weird if, like, we only suddenly return to Earth and they there's not just a war coming, but they also have to explain to Earth what, like, the Galra are, what Voltron is that there is other planets out there with life and stuff like that that's how far behind earth is so i think that worked out well and suddenly doing the kind of keith and his mother kind of thing and i love what they did with the politics of killing zarkon and then the crawl zera coming into play lotor i think definitely was like the star of the season with um uh, every time he spoke you know you, you kind of were you went back and forth on like should i trust him or like actually agree with what he's saying here but i have my doubts and even right up until the end you still have your doubts but you're beginning to trust him and i I thought that was very very well written over the course of the season um and i think it also did a good thing of like setting up stuff going forward in that straight away we're going to get like hagar arriving at oriande and you as we discussed they could potentially do the lotor mother reveal here uh, as like a side plot going on at the same time you're going to be exploring Keith being with his mother for the first time and we're going to get to see those first couple of scenes um, the Shiro stuff they could like do something big with that whenever they want um, so uh, I think there's a lot There's a lot happening here like with, with the politics like Semdak is out there as I suppose our main villain like Hagar is of course a threat as well and then Lotor could also be a threat so even though Zarkon's gone and they've changed things they're still threats um I think the only like ongoing like potential weakness of the show is that it still feels like Hunk is like potentially never going to get an arc of his own it just I I don't know where it's gonna come (laughs) from um and it's been so many seasons now and I think a lot of people are kind of it's sort of becoming a meme level of thing of just like hashtag hunk arc when it's gonna ha- when it's gonna happen um because they, they i think they've set up lance to have some sort of an arc with whatever's going on with shiro they just need to give hunk something similar to this but uh greg what are your final thoughts on uh, season five of voltron yeah no i think overall it it worked for the most part well for me i think it, it still feels like it's you know just like halfway there which it is halfway there so i guess that sort of works in this sort of favor there but i think you know for the parts that we did get getting some history about sort of the galra just sort of seeing you know more development with sort of our most of our our main characters here and sort of you know setting up things to happen on with like the later seasons i think this one definitely did a good job it definitely you know worked a lot better i think it'll definitely be more memorable compared to some some past seasons maybe just because it feels like it's more sort of on track um with things that have sort of happened in the past and it's just sort of moving us you know towards our eventual goal and you know it definitely you know it definitely leaves some things up in the air as far as questioning certain characters certain like their loyalties which i think is actually good as far as just making you know keeping us sort of on the edge of just sort of you know making us wonder of when things are sort of going to happen so no i think for the post part it it works for me even if it could you know potentially have a bit more to it Mm -hmm. and uh thankfully they confirmed immediately when season six is coming uh june 15th is going to be when season six comes out um 
I don't think they confirmed how many episodes it is, but I assume it's going to be six or seven. Um, I don't know if they're still doing it in like 13 episode batches, which would potentially need, lead me to believe that this will be seven coming up, because when they switched to this, they did like 13, 13, 7, 6, now they've done 6 again, will they do 7 again? I'm, I'm not entirely sure if they're still doing it like that, but either way, we're going to get 6 or 7 episodes, maybe they'll do more. Um, and I think where we're at with the overall season is that um, we have, I think we've had 45 episodes so far, and we know that we're getting at least 78, so we're you know, a little bit over halfway, uh, and there's probably, you know, at least still, you know, four to five more kind of of these smaller seasons still to come, which is uh, very interesting to think about that, like, there's still so much left, and they've already done some pretty huge things, even just in these episodes, so, um, uh, but I suppose us knowing that we're, we're going to be going back to Earth at some point, um, the Shiro thing could be a kind of longer kind of scale arc um, the hunk probably is going to get an arc at some point there's there's still a, a lot of scope to do stuff here because like we sort of said earlier on they've only, the, the coalition have only got back a third of the the empire and now that Lotor is in charge of the empire like how much is he going to want to like keep as part of the empire or is he going to want to keep any and like what specifically is Galra space now? Because let's not forget, like planet Dibazol is a husk of a planet now. Basically, it, it's it, they can't really go back there. So you know, there's always going to be a case of like just for them to live on a planet, they're going to have to use planets they've captured, um, unless they just live in space. So there's still complications to be resolved here. So there's there's a lot of stuff going on, but. Uh, yeah, that's been the, the review for Voltron Legendary Defender Season 5. It's been myself and uh, Greg. Um, next week we'll be back to the Avatar Online podcast. We'll finally do our uh, Air Nomad Genocide uh, discussion topic, which should be uh, a pretty big one, a fun discussion when we do it next time out. Um, so that will be next week's podcast. But uh, yeah, that's been this week's uh, for Vol the Voltron podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening to this podcast and bye. Bye-bye.